Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. As many of you know, this online program is part of a weekly or a series of weekly short programs that I off have offered for the last few months where I focus on a particular object or image in our collection while the building is closed. I should add, though, that our building will be reopening. On October 15th, we will have the first uh, self-guided tours of our gallery in many, many moons, although we are asking you to make reservations in advance, and there'll be timed entry, people will be wearing masks, social distancing will be enforced, all of those things to make sure that we stay safe, but our building will be reopening. We ask you to make reservations if you're interested in coming for a gallery tour. But while the building's closed and while it's hard to get in and out, I'm gonna to continue to offer these uh, programs that look at particular objects in our collection. Uh, two other comments that I always try and make before I begin. One, to encourage all of you to post any questions you might have that come up during the talk into the Q&A window. Just find the Q&A button and type in your question. And the second is I wanted to thank everybody who's made donations to support HMTC's virtual programming over the last couple of months. And uh, thank you for your support. If you haven't made a contribution, again, of course, I would ask that you go to our website, www.hmtcli.org, and click the Give Now button. Okay, today I'm going to be talking about a photo in our gallery, in our fifth gallery, which shows the Nuremberg trials. And before I talk more about the photograph and the trials, let me say a special thanks to John Barrett, who's a law professor at St. John's University and one of the foremost experts on the Nuremberg trials in the country. He's right in our back door and uh, right in our backyard. And so um, I wanna thank him. He's, Professor Barrett has kindly done several programs with us over the years and um, he gave, gave some, some wisdom and pearls of, of wisdom for me to prepare for today's talk. So thanks to Professor Barrett. Uh, here's the caption that accompanies the photograph in our gallery. It says from 1945 to 1946, the International Military Tribunal tried 22 Nazi leaders in Nuremberg, Germany for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Very few Nazis were imprisoned. So that's a pretty succinct summary, but it leaves much unsaid and much unexplained. And I wanted to talk today about the photograph and some of what we're unable to fit into the limited space of that caption. To back up, let me give a, back, a bit of background and repeat what you may well know already about the uh, trials that are often referred to as the Nuremberg trials. As our caption says, our photographs from the International Military Tribunal. This is perhaps the most well-known trial that sought to provide some measure of justice after the Holocaust, but it was neither the first nor the last. In October of 1943, the leaders of the Allied powers met in Moscow for a series of 12 meetings about working cooperatively in the fight against Nazi Germany. And one of the four main outcomes of those meetings was the Moscow Declaration of Ger on German Atrocities, signed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, British Prime Minister, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin. The declaration stated that at the time of an armistice, Germans deemed responsible for atrocities, massacre, massacres or executions, would be sent back to the countries in which those crimes had been committed in order to be judged and punished according to the laws of the nation concerned. But the declaration added another line which said that major war criminals whose crimes could not be assigned to any single geographic location would be punished by joint decisions of the allied governments. Of course, in October of 1943, when the Moscow Declaration was made, the Allied victory was hardly a sure thing. As you can see in this map, the Red Army had made some slight headway in the Ukraine, and the United States had landed in Italy by October of 43, but this was eight months before the D-Day invasion, and the Nazis and their, uh, and their allies, shown here in white, controlled almost all of Europe. In early 1945, with Allied victory much more clearly in sight, the leaders met in Yalta, where Roosevelt proposed a more detailed uh, idea and urged for the creation of an international tribunal. 
that should be convened to try Nazi leaders for planning and waging war of aggression and for war crimes. And in August of 1945, in the wake of the victory over Germany, the European Advisory Commission, which had also been established during the Moscow Conference, issued the Nuremberg Charter, setting down the rules and procedures for an international military tribunal to try three categories of crimes, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The first war crimes trial, however, was held much earlier, in July of 43, even before the Moscow Conference, let alone the end of the war. The first trial was held by the Soviets. A Soviet military tribunal met in Krasnodar, a city in southern Russia, for a trial of 11 defendants, all members of the German military, police, or SS, who were accused in participating in the murder of 7,000 people during the German occupation of that city. 15 other defendants, including the com commander of the German 17th Army and the local head of the Gestapo, were also included in the trial, although in absentia. All 11 of the men who were in the trial were found guilty. Eight were hanged and three received prison sentences. There were literally, literally dozens of other war crimes trials, trials that followed, although most of them were held after the war. And these trials, trials were held all over Europe. This map shows the sites of many of these trials, and you get a sense of the broad effort to use the courts to find justice after World War II. But it was the first international military tribunal, which concluded 74 years ago this month, that would become the most well-known of the trials. And that's the trial that's captured in our photograph. Our photograph shows the first day of the trial, on November 20th, 1945, when the indictments against 22 of the top surviving German leaders were read. The man shown standing at the podium reading the indictments uh, was Sidney Alderman one of the chief members of the American prosecutorial team. And he's actually in the process of reading in this photograph, the more than 90 pages of indictment. Behind Alderman, you can see there are four tables that were set up in the courtroom, each one for one of the prosecut prosecutorial teams of one of the four nations involved. The largely empty table behind Alderman's left shoulder was for the American prosecution team, which was headed by American Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who President Truman tapped to serve as the US Chief Counsel for the prosecution of Nazi war criminals. A close look at the photograph, however, shows that Justice Robert Jackson is not actually in the room in our photograph. And that gives actually a clue as to the date, which as I said, was November 20th. The reason Justice Jackson is not in the room is because he was still working on his opening statement, which he would present the following day on November 21st. The table behind Alderman's other shoulder, which we only see a portion of and some of the chairs from, was the British table, the British prosecution's table. Further to the right in the photograph is the Russian table, and then there is the French prosecution. Um, one of the challenges posed by having an international tribunal held by four partner nations was the fact that the four prosecut prosecuting teams were all structured as equals with no one person or one country overseeing or managing the trial. Instead, the chief prosecutors from all of the four countries met and divvied up the responsibilities and decided on approaches. So the US handled count one, which was the conspiracy charge. The UK covered count two, which was the crimes against peace. The Soviet Union took count three, war crimes, and the French took crimes against humanity, the fourth count. They also divvied up the cross-examination of witnesses and defendants. But of course, there was a lot of overlap and repetition. One clue in our photograph about who is speaking is the fact that nobody at the American or British tables is wearing a headset. Instant translation was provided in various languages during the trial. And you can see here that some of the Russian prosecutors 
and some of the defense attorneys sitting in the front right side of the photograph are wearing the headsets and getting the translation. Most people are also reading along with Sidney Alderman as they were all given copies of the indictment that Sidney Alderman is going through. Alderman and the rest of the four prosecuting teams made their case to an international tribunal of judges with one primary judge and one alternate judge from each of the four countries. Those judges are outside the frame of our photograph, but another image from the same day, maybe even very close to the same time, shows Alderman at the podium and the panel of judges who he's presenting to. This is a kind of grainy image, so I found another clearer image that doesn't have Alderman, but shows you the judges in color, and you can get a better sense of what the courtroom looked like. Um, at the left end are the Russian judges. You can see the Russian flag behind them. Then the British and the Americans, led by Francis Biddle, who's the man on the left here, who FDR had named as the U.S. Attorney General during the war, and then Truman named as the main judge for the Nuremberg trials. And finally, the French judges are on the right. The other key group in our photograph, of course, are the defendants. After much debate, 24 defendants were chosen to represent a cross-section of the Nazi diplomatic, economic, political, and military leadership, but only 21 appeared in the court. Notably missing from the 24 people, or the 21, were Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, and Joseph Goebbels, all of whom had committed suicide before the end of the war. The IMT, the International Military Tribunal, decided not to try those three men posthumously because they didn't want to convey any doubt about their death, and they didn't want to suggest that maybe the trial was needed for them because they were still alive. Three others were also chosen for the trial who didn't appear. Nazi Party Secretary Martin Bormann was tried and convicted in absentia, as at the time it wasn't clear whether Bormann was dead, alive, or somehow fleeing Germany. Many years later, his remains were identified, and scholars agree that he died during the Battle of Berlin on May 2nd, 1945, but at the time it was not known. A second person not in the court was Gustav Krupp, the German industrialist, who was included in the original indictment, but because of his age, he was 75 and senile, and because of his failing health, it was decided to exclude him from the proceedings. He ended up dying uh, just five years later in 1950. Finally, the head of the German labor front, Robert Ley, was initially to be included, but committed suicide on the eve of the trial. That left 21 defendants, of which 12 are caught in our photograph. I won't go through them all, but the highest ranking Nazi to be tried in the IMT is this man in the front row, all the way to the left, Hermann Goering, who had served in various positions in the Nazi party and in the Nazi state, including as head of the Luftwaffe, and the head of the four-year plan. Next to Goring is Rudolf Hess, a personal aide to Hitler who also served as the deputy party leader of the Nazi party. And next to Hess is Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister who played a role in the annexation of Bohemia, the attack on Poland, and worked to persuade the leaders of occupied countries to deport Jews to Nazi concentration camps. Here's a, a different photograph that shows all 21 defendants in the International Military Tribunal. Bormann was the 22nd defendant, but as I said, he was tried in absentia. The trial went on for a year, with the judges delivering their final verdict on October 1st, 1946. All, uh, sorry, three out of the four judges had to come to an agreement about to convict any one person of any one charge. In the end, 12 of the de defendants were sentenced to death. 10 of them were hanged on October 16th. Hermann Goring, as I said, committed suicide the night before. Maybe I didn't say that, but he did. Uh, and Martin Bormann, as we later found out, was already dead. Three of the defendants received life imprisonment. Four others received prison terms of between 10 and 20 years, and three people were acquitted. Let me add a few more points about the photograph and what it shows and does not show. First, I think you'll agree 
that it looks like you would expect a trial to look. Uh, there are lawyers, judges, defendants. There's a lot of paper. It seems organized and structured. And as we know, this snapshot was part of a very long, drawn out process. In many ways, I think, the photograph captures what the Allied powers wanted people to see of the International Military Tribunal. It was the first trial after the war that was jointly held by all four Allied powers and so was a major news event. The Allied powers wanted to show that the Nazi leaders were being held accountable, but they also wanted to show that the trial was legal. They wanted to highlight the difference between the judicial process in Nazi Germany, where the law was whatever the Fuhrer decided it was, as distinct from the legal process in England, France, and America, where there was a real process of the law. Stalinist Russian, Russia, of course, was a different story, but in general, the Allies wanted to show that they were providing a fair trial, where the final decision of guilt was based on a body of evidence, and that the trial uh, was based on law. One of the things that's not clear from our photograph, however, is about what followed the trial. The 10 hangings were carried out, but the prison sentences were often far shorter than the original sentences meted out by the judges. Of the three defendants who were punished with life imprisonment, only one, Rudolf Hess, served the full term. The two others were released in 1957. Uh, that included Eric Rader, the commander of the German Navy, who was released actually after 10 years, and Walter Fund, Hitler's Minister of Economics, who was released after 11 years. Both released early due to ill health, but both survived for several years after the trial, or for after their release. And while three of the four who received prison terms of between 10 and 20 years served the full term, all of them were out of jail by 1966 and were able to live out their years in Germany. And this was the trial of the leading Nazis. I guess my point here is that our photo captures a snapshot of what we want justice to look like, but sometimes justice is hard to define. Does the hanging of the 10 leading Nazis bring justice for the victim? Does 20 years in prison or 10 or five mean that justice has been dealt? And how do you hold an entire nation accountable? That's, I guess, one of the other points that I think often gets lost when looking at the photographs like this one of the International Military Tribunal. Uh, when Americans talk about the Nuremberg trials, I think they often confuse the various post-war trials. Our photograph is from the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, which tried 22 defendants. But the unity of the Allied powers faded by 1946 and 1947. So there were subsequent trials, 12 subsequent trials held in Nuremberg, but those were held as American military tribunals without Russian, British, or French assistance. Those countries set up their own post-war trials. In the 12 post-war trials held after the IMT, after the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, the United States tried 177 defendants. 161 of whom were convicted and 16 were acquitted. 37 were sentenced to death. The other 140 were given prison sentences of various lengths. Those numbers sound like justice was served. 180 convictions overall and almost 50 death sentences. It's a small population, percentage of the population of Germany to be sure, but it includes the conviction of almost 200 leading figures. But what happened after the sentences were given shows a very different picture. Sadly, even just a bit of digging shows a shocking dis difference between the sentences that were issued and what people actually served. In the doctor's trial, for instance, which was the first follow-up trial in Nuremberg, there were 23 defendants, seven were executed, seven were acquitted, and nine were given prison sentences that ranged from life down to 10 years. But when you look at those that went to prison, the most that anyone served was eight years. The names in blue show the people who were sentenced to between 10 and 20 years, but none of them served more than five. The names in red are people sentenced to life, but none of them served more than eight years. 
and the total of 65 years of prison sentences that were given out to the people who didn't get life, only 18 years were actually served. In the lawyers and judges trial, four people received life sentences and six were given sentences of between five and 10 years in jail. But everyone, including those who had gotten life, everyone was released within a decade. And in the IG Farben trial of 1947 and 48, of the 23 defendants, almost half, 10 of the 23 were acquitted. And then of the 13 who received prison sentences, seven were released in a year or less, and only two people served more than two years. Perhaps the most troubling case is what happened after the Einsatzgruppen trial, the trial of 24 commanders of the mobile death squads that operated behind Nazi front lines and murdered some 2 million people, mostly by bullets. All 24 defendants were found guilty, but of the 14 death sentences that were issued, only four were carried out. One other person died in 1955, the other nine were all released within 15 years. And for the 10 people sentenced to prison, one committed suicide and one died right after the trial, but five were released after three years or less. And the final three who'd been sentenced to 20 years each were released within six years. So while we can say of the 199 defendants tried in Nuremberg that 180 were convicted and 49 were sentenced to death, a closer look shows that most of those punished were out of jail by the late 1950s, even those, even those who had been convicted uh, and ascribed to the death penalty. What explains this disparity between the sentences given in the trial and the actual sentences lived? One major factor was the Cold War and America's need for expertise in fighting the Soviet Union in the period by 1947. Many of the Nazis who were convicted had great experience in fighting the Soviet Union and so became a source of great value to the American military and to the American covert operations. The American government simply backpedaled and stopped pushing for the prosecution of Nazi criminals. Germany was also not interested in pushing for the prosecution as it sought to get past the war. Germany as a nation wanted to move forward and not to be constantly reminded of its misdeeds. Commuting the sentences of convicted Nazis and not going forward with the death sentences all helped reduce news coverage and publicity that might have talked much more about the war and reminded the Germans about their past. This topic, of course, deserves much more attention than I can dedicate here but I wanted to highlight that our photograph is the tip of a very complicated iceberg. One that shows the ideal of justice after the Holocaust, but one that also hides the reality of the outcomes of the post-war trials. And a photograph I think that raises the larger questions about what justice actually means and how can you create justice or how can there be a just result after something like the Holocaust. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, and I see some of you do, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll try and answer them. Let me take a moment to remind you of some of our other upcoming virtual programs. Tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. in our second program to honor Hispanic Heritage Month, we'll be hosting a virtual screening and discussion about Viva La Cosa, a documentary about the Delano Grape Boycott of the 1970s and the work of Cesar Chavez. A post-screening discussion is going to be led by local community activist Nelson Melgar. And I should make clear that by registering and uh, clicking onto Zoom, you will be able to see the film, which is about a 35 or 40 minute documentary. We're going to share that over Zoom. Uh, next Wednesday, October 14th at 11, we'll be holding our regular virtual museum tour, but we'll focus this tour on the experience of children during the Holocaust. And let me remind you as well that uh, we will be reopening our doors for in-person self-guided tours on the following day, October 15th, but you need to make an appointment to be allowed to come into the building for those tours as we are restricting the number of people in the building at the same time. And we have a whole set of policies to deal with maintaining social distance and preventing the further spread of corona. Anyway, please check our website for information about that and contact us for a reservation. 
Uh, on Monday, October 19th at 11, I hope you'll join us for an in-person outdoor yoga. This is not virtual, in-person this is, outside though, and with social distancing. So come and enjoy the Wellwind Preserve on Monday, October 19th. And one more program to mention next Tuesday, October 20th, please join me for a discussion with historian David Nassau, sorry, not next Tuesday, but October 20th, uh, historian David Nassau about his new book, The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War, which explores what happened to the one million Holocaust survivors, uh, POWs and uh, former slave laborers who were in Germany at the end of World War II. The book is receiving a great deal of high praise and I hope you'll be interested to hear the author talk about his topic and his research. You can find a full list of our programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And I hope you'll also click on the Give Now button if you.